I'm Sapphire, your ass about the Princess of Darkness, and this is Gretchen. We just got back from watching Twilight or whatever. It's just some dumb vampire movie everyone's obsessed with. <sighs> really, I don't understand why everyone's making such a big deal. It's just a movie based on a book. Like, it already exists. Try reading for once, maybe? Anyway, we've just been sitting in my room rocking out to Paramore. I've been having these, like, really philosophical thoughts about things that I like and things that I don't like. So I've been trying to, like, compile it all into a list so I could share it. And before you say anything, I know it's all subjective, okay? Shut up, you dumb posers. Quit flaming my videos. Ugh. Anyway, number one. I hate being owned. Like, I'm not some dumb lamb for you to send out to the paddock to mow your lawn with my mouth. Like, I'm actually a person. Try treating me like it. Number two, I hate... Well... Well, actually, um... <laughs> it's, um... It's funny to mention the idea of being a lamb and hating it. The lamb is so young, so needy. The lamb does seek out support, whatever that support might manifest itself as, and, well, should the lamb find himself on a farm, the lamb may well be owned. The farmer raises the lamb for slaughter, but the lamb needs the farmer to live. There's this line in Twilight about lambs. I'm sure you've heard it before. What fascinates me is the strange nature of it. Because it's played so much for romance, and yet the bloody words come sung through the teeth of the world's most dangerous predator. And so the lion fell in love with the lamb. I was always going to eat it right down to the Lucifer, the brightest, most beautiful star. Fe the piece is, of course, futile. Helios would again take the sky, and Achilles would command the Greeks to mar Maria and turn to watch Eloise die at last. Rosalind sits upright, presses her forehead to mine. Should we help her? My pauses before pushing her back down. In the end, it was Leah who placed Miri in from where she'd never return. Macbeth's bones lay apart from Duncan's and burning. The forest refuses their ashen dance tomorrow and tomorrow. And Adele is told a command that, through lashings, both she and Lorelei will be. You clearly don't know anything about love. It's a line that should be easy, clear-cut in what it means. It comes in Rose Glass's Love Lies Bleeding as Lou and her sister Beth fight over the morals of murdering Beth's abusive husband, JJ. At the height, Lou admits that she's glad that JJ is dead. After all, he was a monster and she couldn't bear to see the way that he hurt her sister. To which Beth replies by giving that very line. You clearly don't know anything about love. This, ironically, comes spat through Beth's half-bruised and puffy face, an ever-present reminder of the coarse action of JJ's hands. But it isn't just irony at play here, is it? There's this whole discussion about the ferocity of love and the ends to which one can justify a turbulent blade. As a matter of fact, why don't we look at what directly precedes this very scene? Lou rescues Jackie from captivity, and the pair find themselves on a tennis court. There they engage in a game of desperate volleys, Lou pleading with Jackie, Jackie screaming at the top of her lungs, I wish I never met you, all while firing round after round at Lou. And missing every shot. Sure, each shot lands in the court by Lou's body, but Jackie's screams, her cries, the exuberant romantic pain that seems to crush her whole body, I mean, it all seems to point Jackie's gun back toward herself. 
I wish I never met you is not a threat. It's an attempted severance of Jackie's own desires. Yes, she fires a proposed want with each bullet, but she cannot bring herself to hit the woman she loves. Her desire, her lust, her adoration, her love lies bleeding in the true target of her outrage. Herself. And take note too that Jackie has already killed only one scene prior. In fact, it's what got her into captivity in the first place. And each time she does it, it clearly breaks her. The first time, her murder of JJ, we find her non-verbal in a bathtub, and the second time, her murder of Daisy, she runs away to a payphone and calls her younger brother in tears. She tells him never to fall in love. All the while, the other end of her love, Lou, is hiding Daisy's body from the FBI for no other reason than that she cannot bring herself to hurt the woman she loves, even if it hurts herself. Even if at this point in the film, they are effectively broken up and she really has no reason to be doing this. But who cares, right? People do crazy things for love all the time. What makes these two so different? Well, I think it's the direction that most captivates me. What I mean by that is the direction in which the violence flows. See, I don't think you can really talk about love without also talking about violence. The two are so intrinsically connected. So often love is attributed to the heart, and yet in that we change its shape. We create a love heart, and the body horror author in me sees only transformation. And then we think of Cupid who fires his arrows of love and inflicts upon you a new desire. In that, shall we simply ignore that Achilles would die of an arrow to the ankle after being driven to the walls of Troy for his burning love for Patroclus? Achilles is an interesting note as well. The way that he moves when Patroclus is killed, contrasted with the way that he sleeps when Briseis is taken from him, is... It's fascinating, to say the least. Even that difference in language. Briseis is a taken trophy. Patroclus, whom he loved above all others, is killed by the Trojans. Achilles has this bisexuality that moves across social hierarchy. Patroclus, a man and a soldier no less, is revered. Several books of the Iliad are dedicated to the Greeks fighting to the ends of the earth to protect Patroclus' dead body, all for the fear that Achilles would not get to mourn him. Meanwhile, in the beginning of the book, when Briseis is taken from Achilles, when he loses his trophy and refuses to fight in the war, well, the Greeks all but give up on the idea that their strongest soldier would ever return. It's really fascinating to see the difference in the way that a loved woman is fought over, whereas a loved man is fought for. But Sapphire, why is this section of the essay being shot with such an old camera? What's with this shitty bedroom aesthetic? Like, what is this, the early 2000s? Well, my darling little cherub, you see, I don't actually want to talk about the Iliad for this section of the essay. No, 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 no. The lens that I want to talk about for this section of the essay, well, it's Twilight. And um, I, I recognize that this is the last few books. Um, I have a copy of Twilight, which I left in San Diego because I wanted to make room for other books I was bringing home. Um, and I was certain that my mum had a copy of Twilight somewhere in the house. But for the life of me, I can only find these three. Um, like, I, I just, this is, this is what I'm working with. I'm not gonna go out and buy another copy of Twilight because you know what? When I left it in San Diego, I didn't actually read it. I just left it there. It was, it, it was just dead weight in my luggage. And now I've got these, I, I'm just rambling. Let's move on. Next part of the essay. And so the lion fell in love with the lamb. First of all, ContraPoints has a whole other essay about love and violence that goes so much further into this line than I'm going to do. It is fantastic. I highly recommend it. I'll try not to retread too much of the same ground here. For me, it's not just that line, but the entire scene that I find fantastic. Every single line that Edward says is a threat. I am the world's most dangerous predator. Every part of me is designed to kill you, as if you could stop me. And so the lion fell in love with the lamb. 
Edward is constantly moving throughout the scene. He cannot simply stand still and talk. Every line, and hence threat, that he says, he runs. And then comes back to say another. What irony we have here. Oh no, you couldn't possibly fall in love with me. I'm far too dangerous. I'd kill you. Ah! And here's all the reasons why I'm so dangerous. Look at how beautiful I am. It's a trap to allure you. Ah! <laughs> I don't think that Edward is truly trying to ensnare Bella here. In fact, I don't think that Edward is acting as a predator as he so claims to be. Edward isn't running so that Bella will chase after him, and Edward isn't showing off so that she will step closer to his danger. Edward's running from himself. His feelings, his lust, his love, coupled in with his desire to devour. Well, it's all too much for him. He doesn't know how to process the thought of it. But he does know that he can't resist Bella. On that topic of devouring, I don't think that this film had enough of an oral fixation. When Bella and Edward first kiss, that moment should have lasted minutes, not seconds. Edward with his proposed weapon dangling in front of his apple of Eden. Bella is both the snake and his god, Edward, our Eve, has a foot both in Eden and in sin. That kiss, it becomes a muzzle, it becomes a harness, it becomes a fucking microphone. It is the amplification of lust that mutes his violent need. There's something else too. When Shakespeare wrote the Scottish play, he made such a point of how Duncan impacted Macbeth. There is this understated love between the two of them, whether platonic, romantic, or even just in admiration, that love is there. You see, Macbeth is someone that wears his heart on his sleeve. When Macbeth feels, the room feels. When Macbeth screams, the room buckles. When Macbeth hurts, the forest burns. When Macbeth loves, the crown falls. Well, that is until Act 5, Scene 5 comes around and Lady Macbeth, the woman for who all intents and purposes he's meant to be in love with, dies off stage never to be seen again. This scene has been criticised tirelessly. In fact, I even wrote a Lady Macbeth death scene in a short story of mine, which you'll be able to read in my collection. Squirm, precious thing. But I actually think it fits. You see, Lady Macbeth dies, and Macbeth barely reacts, barely even moves. It is said... Wherefore was that cry? The Queen, my lord, is dead. <laughs> she should have died hereafter. There would have been a place for such a word. And that's that. She's gone. But I don't think of this as lazy writing. In fact, I think of it as the damned point. You see, Lady Macbeth has lost all of her power and in that her presence on the stage. Macbeth doesn't care because at this point he governs his own narrative apart from Lady Macbeth. But when King Duncan dies? Well, actually, We've got a bit of work to do before King Duncan dies. If it is done when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his cirque success that, but this blow might be the be-all and end-all here. But here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we don't jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here that we but teach bloody instruction. That, being taught, return to plague the inventor. 
This even-handed justice commands the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed. And then, and then as his host, I should get this murderer, shut the door, bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan has borne his faculties so meek, has been so clear in his great office that his virtue shall sing like angels, trumpet tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. And pity, like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim, horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the deed in every eye, that tears shall drown the wind. <laughs> I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent. Only vaulting ambition which overleaps itself and falls upon the other. He has almost supped. Why hath you left his chamber? We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honoured me of late, and I have brought golden opinions of all sorts of people which should be worn now, not cast aside so soon. <laughs> Was the hope drunk then wherein you dressed it? Hath it slept since, and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? <laughs> well, to this such I can't thy love. Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemst the ornament of life, and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat of the adage, pretty? I dare do all that becomes a man who dares does more is none. What beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than that, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you. <laughs> I have given suck, and know how tender tis to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nibble from his teething mouth and dashed the brains out. Had I so sworn as you have to this? If we should fail, we fail! <sighs> but screw your courage to the sticking place and will not. The way he struggles, the very idea of taking a blade to Duncan's chest, let alone the act, is enough to turn him an adversary against his wife. I think this scene is often played too understated. I've seen Macbeth performed numerous times now, both on the stage and on the silver screen, and rarely has it ever captured me as much as the written play does. It's quite common for this scene to be played as a fight between the monarchs to be, rather than the torment of Macbeth and the hunger of Lady Macbeth. See, Macbeth isn't fighting Lady Macbeth here, and that is his eventual undoing. Macbeth is only fighting himself and his want for Duncan. 
So, Macbeth refuses the idea, even after claiming he is settled at the end of the scene, because what then? Does our dear Macbeth go willingly into the dagger and sink Duncan into where he is owed? Of course not! Macbeth moves towards Duncan's chamber and breaks, as though he has never walked before, as though he has never dreamed. He looks up. And what's that he sees? It, is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand? C come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Tell me, fatal vision, art thou not sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou a dagger of the mind? False creation, preceding the heat-oppressed brain. I see thee yet, in form as palpable as this which yet I draw. And thou marshalst me toward where I was going. And such an instrument I once to use. <laughs> My eyes are made the fools of the other senses. Or else worth all the rest. I see these still. Disbelief becomes his companion. The dagger appears before him, and Macbeth refuses to accept that perhaps he took it there himself. The dagger moves towards Duncan's chamber, and Macbeth creates it as a phantom operation for which he merely observes. The very thought of having killed Duncan is so much so that he severs himself from his own actions. In essence, he takes the dagger first to his image of himself, and then to Duncan's chest. Following this, Macbeth, in his fear of the weird sister's prophecy that he himself shall be king, but his friend Banquo shall sire a long line to usurp him, kills his friend in the dead of night. And then, at dinner, in front of his whole court, Macbeth succumbs to the phantom appearance of the friend whom he betrayed. Now, Macbeth obviously tries to contain himself at first, but it all comes to a head. And Macbeth lets loose his crown of silver pieces to scream. What man dare Rugged Russian bear, the armed rhinoceros and the high Korean tiger take any shape but that! My firm nerves shall never tremble. <laughs> Or be alive again, and dare me to the desert with thy sword in trembling. I inhabit, protest me, the baby of a girl! Heads! Horrible shadow! Heads! Oh. 
closer. Closer. Act 1, scene 7 gives us refusal. Act 2, scene 1, denial. Act 3, scene 4, a seizure of power. And Act 5, scene 5, Lady Macbeth's death, an owning of agency. Act 3, scene 4 might be my favourite scene in the entire play because it shifts the power dynamic of having been Lady Macbeth's to Macbeth's. Of course, that is a whole other essay, so let us refocus onto this one. Near the beginning of the story, Edward is following Bella from within the shadows and lunges out at the last minute to save her from a group of men who plan to have their way with her. This is followed by the pair driving off and Edward snarling the line, I should go back there and rip all their heads off. And shortly after that, can you talk about something else so I don't turn around? There is so much to unpack here. Let's start with Edward in the Shadows. Much like Macbeth and his phantom dagger, Edward refuses to acknowledge his own agency and misuse of power. In the car, he keeps saying to Bella, you have no idea what those men were thinking. Their thoughts were awful. They were vile people. And one assumes he's referring to sexual assault, a perversion of power, an extortion of one's own desire to control. But then how do we weigh this against Edward's perversion of power in his stalking of Bella. He even continues this expulsion of his desire to control throughout the narrative. He refuses to allow Bella to become a vampire. He runs from her at the end of the film because he thinks this will keep her safe. And here, he follows her like some pet for which he admires. But then he's turned violent when other men want impurely of his Bella? The truth of the matter is that Edward wants Bella as his own, but the two barriers are that A, he will not yet admit that he wants Bella because it forces him to confront both his desire to love and to taste, and B, he will not ever admit that his desire is being mutely explored through a different perversion of power, thus equating him to the men he so wishes to harm. All this to say, Edward wants to harm the group of men because he subconsciously is displeased with and wants to harm himself. To say that Edward is bottling up his emotions is an understatement. From the moment we meet him, Edward treats everyone around him as culprits of the emotions he has complete control over. His inability to face the truth of his lust and the intersection that lust has with a violent need is eating him alive. Perhaps we can even see this physically manifested later in the series when the baby he has with Bella begins to eat her from the inside out, finally forcing his hand to give up power. Critics would tell you it's heartache, longing, immobilized men succumbing to a feeling of yearning. But as we've seen, these aren't immobilized men and certainly they aren't longing for something out of grasp. Each of these men, through one way or another, fights vigorously for that which they think to be owed. Yearning isn't that. Yearning is gentle. It is the lingering thought that she might have violets in her lap, not the inquisition as to how one might come to taste them. It is an invitation into the breadth of what one already has. It is gentle in the most violent of ways. It is soft as such is the sun when scorching it brushes your cheek. Yearning is to give, and to never hope that any might be given back. Yearning is a kind of hunger in that sense. Letter writing comes to mind. A pastime, keepsake, and proclamation of wanting all in one beautiful moment. I invite you to imagine two lovers stood either side a war and encountering each other not at the ends of rifles, but in scented ink. 
Imagine these two as they create across their battles an unending tapestry of the moments they fall in love. And those letters become precious, secrets to be held away from the far-reaching hands of either side's superior. Well, imagine if in one such letter, where the ever-present yearning becomes a hunger known only to the pen, that one party, and in that bow, let loose those secret words that make them of each other's. There, Red stands, shocked across the scene. Blue had just saved her life. Blue, the enemy officer, the one who fights for the other side. Blue, the one leaving her speechless and blabbering all at once. Blue, the one for which she is now stunned. And so Red, taking this fleeting moment in hours, not seconds, unsheathes a pen, shaped as such a blade, with which she points toward her own bleeding heart and writes, Dear Blue, I leave you a letter sealed in wax, a trace of perfume. Scent for me is a medium. I rarely ever use it for ornamental purposes. I hope I've selected a fragrance to your taste. The papers from Wuhan, Song Dynasty, handmade. Leave it in a damp place and it will rot. Add it to water and you'll have a pulp. Destroy it in your own way, on your own, if you want. I won't mind. We all have our observers. And this letter is a knife to my neck if cutting's what you want. It's so hard to move here and reply to your last letter. I feel, I'm not sure what precisely. I'm shaken. You know the edges of old maps with monsters and mermaids? Here there be dragons. <laughs> I'm not sure what road leads forward. But your letter hungers for reply. I read your last missive, reread it in my mind as you told me I would so long ago, preparing for a fall. I see you as a way as a bird, as a wolf, my wolf, with the six legs and the double back dives. I try not to think of you the same way twice. Thinking creates patterns in the brains, and those patterns can be read by one sufficiently determined, so... So I change your shape in my thoughts. It's amazing how much blue there is in the world if you look. Your different colours of flame. Bismuth burns blue. Cerium, germanium, arsenic. See? I pour you into things. I suspect you see me plainly by now. Imagine me shifting, uncomfortable, exposed. My way was always the straightforward push. I only feared that you'd view these long letters as the sign of a simple or more desperate brain. I feared, and perhaps you'll laugh, that you responded on sufferance. So let me be clear. I like writing you, I like reading you, 
when I finish your letters, I spend frantic hours composing my replies, debating ways to send them. I can create any number of chemical ups and downs with a carefully worded phrase. A factory within me will smelt any drug I seek. But there's a rush in reading and sending against which no drug compares. So in this letter, I am yours. Not gardens, not your missions. Yours, alone. I am yours in other ways too. Yours as I search the world for your sign, as pathetic as a Harris books. Yours as I debate methods, motives, chances of delivery. Yours as I review your words by their sequence, their sound, their smell, their taste. Careful that no one memory becomes too worn. Yours. Still, I suspect you will appreciate the token. I'll try for a library next time. I hope you understand my need for a change of plans. Yours. Red. Amal El Matar and Max Gladstone's This Is How You Lose the Time War describes such a purity of giving in Red's words. The way she asks for nothing, just to be had. And even then, she never once asks Blue to take her. In fact, she laments that she would die peacefully if Blue were to take this as her sign. And in this letter, I am yours. And in that statement is not just the romantic giving, but the chance at fate as well. Because Blue could take this and use it as a weapon to destroy Red if she should like to. Well, Red would have written it regardless. The sentiment comes repeated at the end of the book when Red is tasked by her agency to murder Blue through one of their no longer secret letters. Shortly before Red writes to Blue, begging her not to read it, that this here shall be the end that she would go on happily, having loved and loving still. Well, despite that Blue responds with, as you wish, Blue does receive Red's letter in the guise of a poison plant. It sits there in a laboratory for a time, wilting, taunting Blue, threatening to lose a leaf, and in that, precious words from her lover. Red always intended for this message to go unknown. But Blue? Well, she was always going to eat it right down to the root. And she does, killing herself with her lover's pleas a velvet poison. The temptation to know Red's love one final time was too much. Deathly endings not near enough award as weepers would hope. One of Sappho's fragments comes to mind, specifically 172, and you'll have to forgive me, my ancient Greek is a little bit rusty, but I believe it's pronounced something along the lines of aliosthidros. I can be drastically wrong, but regardless, I've seen it translated multiple times now, and Carson in If Not Winter translates it as pain giver. And whilst the sentiment is nice, I much prefer Mary Bernard's translation in Sappho, a new translation of the complete works, where she translates it as Eros, pain giver. It's a minor change with only the addition of one name, the god of erotic desire, but I think the breadth of what it adds to the fragment is substantial. You see, either Eros is the pain giver in that it is through erotic desire that we cause harm to others, or Eros is the pain giver in that we are pained by our lust. Thusly, in the latter, the true pain giver is ourselves, where Eros remains blameless but for the temptation. 
Think of Edward and his insistence on predator versus prey imagery, his violent tendencies against those that take his desire, or Achilles and his war against Hector, Macbeth and his war against all of Scotland's nobility. In that, these men cause harm to others for the lust that they fight for. But then we think of red and blue and their brave dance with death, of Jackie and Lou and their being torn asunder by nothing more than their need. Or we think of Adele and Laura like, oh, actually, hold that thought because we've not quite gotten there yet. These women are tormented by nothing more than their lust. And yet they will endure, for their reward, their lover, is what they truly crave. Even the name Eros does quite a lot to the fragment. In English, we're quite fond of saying Eros, but in ancient Greek, it was pronounced Eros, where the ro becomes a rolled R and the following omega really lengthens the body of the word. It lingers on the tongue a moment longer than expected, almost interrupts the flow of any sentence it appears in. Eros forces us to stop, immobilizes us in a sense, and asks us to consider the meaning of what is lust. April Yates and Ray Wilde's Lies That Bind explores a sapphic relationship put to ruins by self-induced immobilization. Adele and Lorelai crave each other more so than anything. Their love, though certainly rocky and unhealthy in the beginning, is raging enough that in their failures to each other as partners comes submission to violent severance. The mysterious woman, Viola, seduces the lovers, forcing Adele onto her knees and Lorelai to explore the turbulent extent of her passion. She confronts both lovers with what it is they truly desire and allows herself as a greedy vessel to enjoy it. But why was she able to do that, and so easily at that? <clears throat> well, you see, Adele and Lorelai, the former secretly craving to be dominated and the latter to dominate, fear that revealing this violent desire of theirs will tarnish the love that they share. Their fear is that their truth, in which is violence, will come in the way of their lust. And so they stay silent, refusing to talk about what it is they truly desire, slowly but surely eroding the love that they share. And then comes Viola, mischievous instructor, and spells disaster for the lovers who lie. They're stuck. And in that stuckness, they fall apart completely. Viola, and later on another character, Rose, successfully infiltrate, adulterize, and tear apart Adele and Lorelai's relationship, all the while dangling the pair in front of each other like starved mouths hungry for the other's spit. Earlier on, we're introduced to this idea of the tower, an image that immobilizes both characters in this unavoidable gaze. Well, here we see it again. Only this time it doesn't immobilize, in fact both characters keep fighting. Each other, yes, themselves, absolutely, but what's more is that they keep fighting for each other. In amongst the violence of this book, and believe me be, this book gets bloody violent, I think the harshest pain comes inflicted upon the lovers themselves. It's the way that they hold back, hide away their feelings and fear of abandonment. Both of these characters refuse themselves so much so that they are unable to truly be lovers. That name, Eros, is spoken. And both women freeze as they take their time saying it. All this is to say, Adele and Lorelai, through their burning lust, rediscover each other and get back together. What's particularly beautiful is that this doesn't happen fast either. The final chapter of the book is the pair having sex, with Adele bound and being punished, and Lorelai refusing to go on until Adele begs her to continue. They use their lust as a tool to open an honest dialogue about their violent desire, and with this, their relationship seems the healthiest it has ever been. And I'm sure there's no great big worldwide event that takes place shortly after the book that could even slightly come in the way of this love and happiness they've found here at the end.
You clearly don't know anything about love. What a line! So many bullets loaded into a clogged up barrel. Even then, the trigger is still faulty. Because you have to ask yourself, when Beth says this line to Lou, what does she think that she knows of love? Does Beth think of JJ as Achilles? And in that, does Beth think herself Patroclus or Briseis? What length does Beth think that JJ will long for her? Because certainly he is not there in the room while she is fighting with Lou. I mean, sure, he was dead. But so was Eurydice. Beth is not Orpheus. She is not Eurydice. She is not Patroclus. And she is certainly not Briseis. At least Achilles wanted Briseis. Not quite as a lover, but... As something to own. JJ never wanted Beth. He wanted a carer, and once she became broken enough, he would have been more than happy to replace her. Beth was a means to an end, and once that end was met for either one of them, the deal would there be done. But for Lou, Jackie was it. Something I found quite funny was that before Lou and Jackie meet, Lovefly's bleeding could have been about anything. There's Brett for a whole world to exist here. Really, it seems like we're just gonna follow a woman owning a shitty gym. But then their eyes meet, and well, Lou may as well have picked up the camera and started directing something new. It becomes clear immediately that Lou and Jackie are going to get together and that this is what the film is now about. They break up and Lou still hides a body that Jackie killed. Jackie is hurting, kidnapped, and feels so utterly betrayed by Lou. And even still, as she is screaming at the top of her lungs, she wishes they never met. She's crawling closer and closer towards Lou. Their love is unavoidable. It isn't just a direction for the film, it is the direction. The same can be said about Red and Blue of This Is How You Lose a Time War of Adele and Lorelei of Lies That Bind. These women, through the throes of their lust, are unable to avoid the truth of what they want. Their lust is a violent need to eat. And each of them has hungered since the day they were born. Though I think I've been a little bit too avoidant in explicitly detailing the clear separation between masculine and feminine lust here. Now, that's not to say... Man is women! <laughs> It's just that across these narratives, we clearly see men tearing apart others for what is taken from them and women tearing apart themselves for what they yearn for. Even in the heterosexual relationships. I mean, Bella is almost literally torn apart by her future child and in the first book, she does much at the detriment of herself for Edward. Lady Macbeth kills herself. I mean, look, it isn't explicitly detailed that Lady Macbeth kills herself in the play, but how else am I supposed to read that? What, she dies of a broken heart? Lady Macbeth? Yeah, sure she does. <laughs> and then there's Beth. Beaten and broken, but still holding true to this lie of love. Let's make it very clear. Beth is the victim here, but in that She's still hurting herself by refusing the admission of what she must understand is true. Her husband clearly didn't know anything about love. I only briefly mentioned Orpheus and Eurydice, but I think they might be the most important figures of this entire essay. Orpheus and Eurydice are the quintessential story of yearning for your lover. It's why when Hosea asks, imagine being loved by me, he does so only moments after proclaiming that he would embody the lover's doom to depart. See, Orpheus and Eurydice could never have been reunited. But the thing is, if you had told Orpheus in the beginning that he would inevitably turn around looking his lover in the eye, dooming Eurydice to return back to Hades, he still would have made that trip. 
And likewise, if you told Eurydice that only moments away from the gates to her freedom would her lover, the one she trusted above all others, turn around and doom her all over again? She still would have followed Orpheus all the way to those gates just to catch that final look in his eyes. It's Blue's line, I was always going to eat it right down to the root, echoed throughout centuries of storytelling. And I don't think it's any mistake that Orpheus and Eurydice keep having their gender bent throughout their many retellings. Shirley Jackson in The Haunting of Hill House echoes the inevitable and lusting need of the devotee in Eleanor's journey's end in Lover's Meeting. Debate the queerness of Eleanor and Theodora all you like, it's hard to ignore that the final utterance of that line comes mere moments after Theodora professes a desire to live together with her Nell, this of course preceding Eleanor's death. And then Celine Schirma in Portrait of a Lady on Fire writes, Turn around, a line spoken by Eloise to Marianne as, like Orpheus, she is chased out of Hades by the love she will never be able to hold again. And of course, I've already spoken about this is how you lose the time war and it's Orpheus and Eurydice midpoint. This narrative keeps appearing in specifically sapphic media. But what does that have to do with love and violence? If I might return us to Hosea for a moment, I've always been fascinated by his line, imagine being loved by me, because it should be really arrogant. It should be this incredibly masculine expulsion of want, and yet it isn't. And maybe I'm just biased to Hosea, or maybe it's just because it exists within the context of Orpheus and Eurydice, but maybe, just maybe, it's the way that the line isn't a threat of what you might miss out on. It's a promise of what he wants to give. And therein lies what I think makes Orpheus and Eurydice such a sapphic tale. You see, when Eleanor drives into the tree, when Eloise turns to give Marianne a final look, knowing that they'll be separated forever, when Blue eats Red's poison plant, when Orpheus turns to face his Eurydice, each of these characters are losing in their final moments, and yet their love for the other is such that they would. It's a more quiet kind of violence, yes, but I don't think we can ignore that this kind of severance is violent in its very nature. All right, you caught me. I know I lied. I opened this section saying, let's talk about trans people. And then I talked about only cis people. I know, I'm sorry. Just look, let me fix this, all right? Why don't we step back and we'll talk about one of my favorite trans characters of all time. Achilles. <laughs> Suzanne Collins has, to my knowledge, never outwardly stated that The Hunger Games Mockingjay was a retelling of Homer's epic, The Iliad. But I think the parallels are far too potent to ignore. We have a reluctant hero said to be the greatest of all the soldiers refusing to fight because the lover given to them by their previous accolades was stolen away. This hero then sleeps for the first few chapters only to rejoin the battle not as a soldier but as a figurehead to inspire the troops. In doing this, their lover, for whom they devote and sacrifice all, is killed. And with the emotions that boil, they then join the battle in one final foray to kill the enemy's greatest soldier. Added to this, Collins has stated that the original Hunger Games was inspired by the story of Minos and his labyrinth, so I do think that there is some grounds to play here. Let's start with what I left out. Although aligning well with the general structure of the Iliad, Clearly, the stories do differ in the way that key elements are presented to our characters, which, for me, highlights the underlying trans narrative of them both intertwined. So, allow me to present the stories of both in a way that I think is poignant to the essay at hand. So trife and rude a day was this, when there to war went Greeks and Troy. The Greeks in 13th labelled district ruins and Troy, a round flourishing capital from whence the games commence. Tell me, O oh muse, who doth in Greece in Troy, the flags are both so held up high, was it Achilles, swift-footed and notched like a rough-fletched arrow, which, when fired, even as by Apollo, 
son of Leto, with splinter, crack, and flail bolstered bullseye there on its mark. So, Achilles, hero in only the mouths of power, is sought from whence he sleeps and cries upon his bed of Cadmus and Primrose. And there should be said that powers so attained by he are not the ones that should be held with prowess or with cause. Prior here, the Hunger Games, of which Achilles did both win, must still be seen for what did drive, bolting ambition and raging strength? Or was it love and hate for those opposed? Surely one sees, when loose to lift, by Achilles' hand toward Zeus's 75th wrath, he knew not what skyward arrows would there make. As such is his self-sabotage, the art of which is his held true strong. And this Achilles has recently been robbed. Sky fell when cloud-gathering Zeus and Phobos Apollo did strike, from which the peat of burning games came swallowed so by Troy. Briseis, the bought love of Achilles was taken, lost. And so the son of Thetis cries, and there dares not an inch of muscle move. Tell me then, was this a ploy? That with his leave and desperate need that should be brought, to sway him so, such gifts the gods would envy? Or had in loss and pain of loss and repeated for all his time, Achilles wept, not such is life. But woe is he not let be free. Now save your grind, so spoke not warm. This man was lost from where he says is aught. Need not your pity, spear, or hope. Achilles came not to the war for love nor want to save. This hero, so they paint, was dragged from the ruins of his deathless suicide. Of course, I say this all without mention, that soon a gift as eager hope is thrust upon the man. The Greeks, through screens and wired feed, display that they, agents of just, should not be theirs, are in the holy Troy, moving to bring Briseis to the ships. They do. For gone and plain are the Trojans. Their golden gift from Greeks to them. Yet not a single guard did stand. So there, Peter, in guise of she, became the reverse horse of Troy. In care the Greeks did hold him so, and thrust Achilles to know. She's found. O oh, Mew, did love strike, ever the arrow, ever the bane? Did hearts shaped as ankles so give this hero strength? Did Achilles hold his love for sake? No. This hall, now there by the black ships of Greece, was named Briseis. It was named Hector. It was called Peter. And so intrudes the war cross. What I find so fascinating about this Iliad is that Achilles is so loudly a victim. Unlike Achilles, Katniss was never privy to the plans of District 13 to go to war with the capital, but like Achilles, their plan was to use Katniss, their greatest soldier, so painted by propaganda, as a beacon for those around to march. Katniss was meant to die, become a martyr, much the same way that Patroclus became a martyr. Although, I guess I've not yet stated how Patroclus fits into this all, have I? Well. Patroclus, so small amongst the other Greeks, had held a quaint flower behind his ear. <laughs> Primrose, he said it named. Achilles thought the thing too soft.
to pretty. Near the end, where there the Greeks did march, great birds took the skies, let loose a Trojan gift. One thinks, as each floating box exploded, bodies falling, dying, afraid. Perhaps the Greeks had learnt from Troy to lead a horse to water and kill him whilst he drinks. Achilles stood there, watching where had just stood Primrose tucked behind his left ear. Patroclus. Now dead. And such the cause that called Achilles first to play. The game. Prim was never sent to war by Cadmus like happened in the Iliad. In fact, the events of this story unfold because of quite the opposite. Prim was always Cadmus' driving force. She volunteers in her place in the first book. She fights tirelessly with the hope that she might return to provide in the second. And in the third, she watches Prim die and loses it all. I think, up until this point, Katniss is Achilles. But it is the death of Patroclus, who from this point returns as Prim, that brings about a shift. Katniss had an image of Achilles thrust upon her by District 13. It became a mask that she sunk deep inside of, and as we see, she lost her way with. So from this point, we follow Katniss, still pretending, despite the anger she feels about her sister's death. And District 13 continue to use her image, she is their Achilles, and so they bring her to execute the leader of the capital, President Snow, was use. This is their moment to cement who they have made of their Achilles. Zeus has lost all power, may no longer direct the whims of war. The Greeks have sacked Troy. Now all that's left is Olympus. And so, Achilles takes his mark, holds high his bow, notches an arrow. The arrow lands in the neck of District 13's President Coin. Katniss, removing the mask of Achilles, breeds a true breath at last. I think of this moment as the severance, the violent nature of that word being very intentional. This is where Katniss stops pretending to be Achilles transitions, speaks her mind clearly. Seeing Prim die, the reason she ever fought to begin with, feeling the love she has for her sister. Well, Katniss came to a realization that her truth would require violent action. I mean, 
It's not lost on me that the weapon she chooses to use for this is a bow and arrow, the very weapon that would kill Achilles in Troy. And then we think further to the end of the book. Katniss lives peacefully in the ruins of District 12 with Peter, both Briseis and Hector as one. There's this melancholy serenity to their time spent together. Clearly, she does love him, but you can't help but notice the quiet pain in her eyes for being forced to decide this throughout the two Hunger Games in war. Because the truth of her lust is that it was violently made for her. All right, fine. You caught me. I did it again. I lied. I'm sorry. Truly, I am sorry. As a trans person, I ought to be doing so much better, and I promise I will. I will not lie again. Unless... Fuck you! I lied again, but differently this time. I have spent large sections of this essay already talking about real trans people. Don't believe me? Well, check this out. Um, hi. Editing Sapphire here. Um, look. I was meant to record a clip for this part. It was a joke I was going to do with Ray in San Diego at Stakercon. At Stakercon? Stokercon. Um, but I was having so much fun and I didn't. So, like... It would really make my day if you would just laugh at the silly little joke that isn't in this clip. Um, and it would, I think that would be really kind and sweet of you if you would just laugh with me. Like, ha 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 ha, Sapphire, you're really funny. Good job with this video. You did a really good job. You should go in the comments and say, Sapphire, you did a really good job. There we have it. Evidence. Proof from the mouth of Ray Wilde herself. So, it's clear cut. I've talked about trans people. We can move on. But we're not going to, because I can go so much further than that. Let's talk about Love Lies Bleeding again. Are you going to tell me that Lou, the character with a dead name, who near the opening of the film does tea with her girlfriend-to-be, Lou, the character who is misgendered throughout the film, who is constantly and tirelessly in search of true safety, isn't trans? Or perhaps you want to talk about the parallel narrative between Lou and Lou Senior, with Lou Senior, the origin of Lou's name, being something that she's running away from. I mean, is it not interesting that both Lou and Lou Senior seek out violent means in the guise of love, but for Lou Senior, it is to mask his true desire for supreme control. And for Lou, it's something she seemingly has no control over, as she is taken in by her roaring lust. Lou Senior embodies this kind of shadow, Lou's past, the things she is trying to separate herself from, and if I might return us back to lies that bind, Lorelei also lives in that kind of severance between the past and present. Early on in the book, we are introduced to this idea that Lorelei refuses to allow Adele to pleasure her, and later on we'll learn that that comes from Lorelei's fear of her violent BDSM desire, but can we not also view this as an aversion of her truth of herself, that Lorelei is afraid of a confrontation with her trans identity. See, I think sometimes that transition can be an inherently vampiric thing, that no matter how much or how little we change, there must be some act of devouring, where we take in the old to create the new. It's violence for a different kind of love. Love for the self, and an unending need to view the body as a temple to worship. Near the end of Love Lies Bleeding, Lou and Jackie are riding away into the sunrise with the dying body of Daisy in the back of their truck. So much violence has unfolded throughout this film. This moment is weighed down by the liters of blood the pair have spilled. Heavy. And yet, it is hopeful. This moment where the thought of what could become is potent. 
A good friend of mine, Alexis Dubon, said something that I can't stop thinking about. I think this movie is the start of something, not the end of something. God, she's so right! The ending, riding away into the sunrise and not the sunset. The camera focusing in on the characters and not the road ahead. This is the beginning. That severance that Achilles slash Katniss found at the end of their narrative played out here and given this opportunity to become. Love Lies Bleeding is about loving yourself, enough to hold true to what that means. So. What does Lou know about love? Well, with her hands covered in the blood of trying, I'd say that Lou knows nothing. But she's opened herself up to learn so much.